Mayday. 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 She's going down. She's going down. Duck and cover. Mayday. Nothing personal. Word of the day. It's Mayday. Mayday is what you say. I don't know actually why, what the um, etymology of the expression Mayday is. Someone get to me on Twitter. Let me know where that expression comes from. I guess I could just GTS. Mayday is what was going on in several places yesterday. Let's start with the easy one. In the offices of my bosses and yours, CBS Sports. Mayday. Mayday. In the league offices in New York with the NFL. Mayday. Mayday. In the front office of the Kansas City Chiefs. Mayday. Mayday. But in that great town of Buffalo. Opposite of Mayday. June Day. What's the opposite of May? May flowers bring spring chickens. April showers bring May flowers. What happened? Were you watching football? Coke and I are preparing for today's show. And he says, yeah, I watched some football, but I was reading because he's very much a well-read person, Coke is. He reads a lot of books. Coca, by the way, I had five different people this weekend alone want to know whether you actually existed, which, again, is very strange because you're very active on Twitter, and so people know you exist. But in any case, Coca's reading books, eating food, snoozing. Meanwhile, I'm watching the NFC and the AFC championship games. It is the divisional playoffs uh, to see who plays in the championship. The Kansas City Chiefs are playing the Cleveland Browns. It's a big game because, you know, Mike Ryan from Levitard Show, the producer of Levitard Show, loves the Browns. He's just been in heaven. It's been a whole thing. Browns hadn't been in the playoffs since 2002, and they had a great victory last week. Of course, I can't remember who they played against, the Steelers, and we picked them, and they won. And now they were playing the Chiefs. Patrick Mahomes, the son of the Major League Baseball player, we've talked about that, of course, Patrick Mahomes Sr., who was a nice little reliever, by the way. And Mahomes is playing. The Chiefs are winning. It's not a blowout. The line is 10. Our pick of the day was Chiefs minus 10. I feel like we're there. It's 22-10. Everything's going to be fine. And all of a sudden, Mahomes, for whatever reason, is scrambling. And as it is, I think he has a broken toe. Tony Romo kept saying, hey, let's look at his ankle. Um... And I didn't think it was his ankle. The way he was walking so gingerly, it felt like when you're a runner and you have a bruised or broken big toe, you don't realize how much you need your big toe for balance. And when your big toe is broken, the pain is excruciating. So all I kept thinking is they're going to shoot him at halftime with Toradol. They're going to get it from Jeff Conine, who, by the way, today, Coca, is have Jeff Conine is hosting the Jeff Conine annual golf tournament to benefit the Conine Clubhouse at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital in South Florida. Jeff Conine, who is a part of, now, spoiler alert, my closest friend as a former player, and he is so involved in charity, and he holds these golf tournaments totally different now because of COVID. All the partying that we would do before the tee-off and after the tee-off, those are gone Now people are just out there playing 18 holes separately, but raising money. The Conine Clubhouse uh, is where families can stay when their children are being treated for cancer, other such horrific children's diseases that can occur. And when the kids are being treated unbelievably well, Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital, families who don't have means, who don't have options, can stay in the quote-unquote Conine Clubhouse. So Conine is hosting the tournament today. I have no idea why Conine's name came into my head, Coca. I literally have no idea. I mean, I'm thinking about him today, but we must have been talking about something. And, uh, oh, Toradol. So, Conine ran the seven marathons in seven days, and all of us in that team hold the plane. We took Toradol as though it were Tic Tacs because you can't run seven marathons in seven days on seven continents because your legs fall off and you're exhausted, your ribs hurt from breathing. I mean, it's just a nightmare. So, Toradol helps, except it gives you an upset stomach. Dave McGilvery, the race director for Boston Marathon, who we did a Samson sit-down with, the Toradol never kicked in for him. But in any case, Patrick Mahomes, for sure, landed at Coca. Patrick Mahomes needed Toradol for his big toe. So he's got a play where he's going to do some scrambling because I just would have thrown it out of bounds. If I'm Andy Reid, I'm telling him, do not run, please. So Patrick Mahomes takes off running. 
he gets tackled in what looked a little bit like a horse collar, though I know it's not a horse collar because a horse collar is when you get your hand right up in there in the neck. But it was just an awkward sort of tackle. I didn't think Mahomes' head had hit the ground in real time. I didn't think there had been a knee to the head. I didn't think there had been a head to the ground. But Mahomes, upon getting up, did the I just got hit by Ali stumble. And the just getting hit by Ali stumble is when you get to your knees, you stand up, and then you buckle. You look around and say, I think we're in Kansas, Dorothy. That's what the Ali stumble is. And the next thing you know, Mahomes is in the blue tent. I can't believe it's not sponsored, by the way. The blue tent is where NFL players go to get hidden so they can change their jock straps or get looked at. And then concussion protocol starts. And then they're back in the locker room. They're asking him questions. What day is it? Um, a day that ends in Y. Where are you? I'm in the room with you. What's the score of the game? Yes, it is. You are now ruled out. That's what happens during the game when you enter into the concussion protocol, which Patrick Mahomes had to enter into because he exhibited signs of being concussed, which is the Ali stumble. The beautiful part about that is that what you didn't see off camera because they weren't showing it, but I had the nothing personal show. Thank you for all the capital expenditures that CBS does for me in this. I have cameras in the locker room, I have cameras in the Chiefs front office, and I have cameras in the NFL front offices, in the NFL commissioner's office. And here's what was going on in those different places. In the Chiefs front office, it was very simple. They were in danger of losing the game. They go to their backup, Chad Henney, and they are making sure that Andy Reid is on the program, that the calls that are going to be made are going to be aggressive They are going to act as though Mahomes is still the quarterback. They're not going to change one thing. They're going to play the game and hold on and try to win. Easy camera, no fighting. Meanwhile, the president and the owner of the Chiefs is going down to the clubhouse, to the protocol place. They're just saying, please make sure you're available for next week. If we can get through this week, can we convince the NFL to let him come back out and play? Hey, Patrick, how many fingers am I holding? How many fingers? Two, four, one, three, two, just whatever number you say, that's the right number. Can you play? All right, no? All right, we'll get through this game. But the Chiefs front office is focused on Chad Henney being the backup, no problem. It is what it is. Get past the Browns and get to the AFC Championship because that's where we need Mahomes. Now let's go to the CBS cameras. Those are good. Nary a mention by the way, on the Fox telecast, which was the second game between the Bucks and the um, whoever the Bucks played, the Saints. Nary a mention of Mahomes because they're the NFC network. Meanwhile, the CBS network doing the AFC, they are very focused as they begin to plan their week of promotions, their week of commercials, how they're going to shoot commercials, all of the pregame Um, stories they do for the pregame show. You start blocking that out right now. You start putting it into segments and figuring out what's going to be talked about. Do we have to do a Chad Henney segment? That's number one on the list. They bring out their CBS sports pad and they say, all right, we're going to have to go into Chad Henney. What else? We're going to do a story on Pat Mahomes and concussions. We got to think about doing that. We're going to have to talk about Andy Reid, three straight championship games. First time a coach has ever hosted three AFC championship games. We can do a story about Andy Reid. But here's what we're really doing. We are saying to ourselves at CBS, Patrick Mahomes has got to play. And they're ringing the, be- the buzzer of the NFL, studio, the, the NFL commissioner's office. And here's how that call goes. Hey, Roger. Yeah, it's Sean. Roger, listen, we got a quick question here. Um, what protocol are you guys using? Because we really need Mahomes against Allen because we need Mahomes in the Super Bowl. It's a CBS Super Bowl. And Mahomes against either Rodgers or Brady is a slam dunk, right? Without a question. Whatever you have to do to protect Pat Mahomes and enable him to play, whatever protocols you have to change, because every team has its own protocols, I'll bring in the head of doctoring at CBS, and we will say, hey, he's good, he's good. Look at him. Follow the line. No, no, look at me and follow my finger. 
That's that's good, Patrick. No, no, that's good. That's good. All right, I'm going to bring you on the field. Can you do a quick down and in? What's that tight end's name? Coca Kelsey? I don't think that's his name. Kelsey's pretty good, though. Whoever their tight end and who's so good, but I'm pretty sure I have his name wrong. Travis Kelsey. Hell yeah, Coca. Just we're going to bring Travis in. We'll pay him 150 bucks for an extra day of practice. No problem. Just quick, right, right in front of us. A quick down and in. Patrick, just aim. Here's what we do and what we tell the players when they've had too much to drink and they're going to play. Aim for the middle guy. If you see three players all in a row and they look like they're the same guy, it's likely they are. So aim for the middle one and you'll be fine. Roger, we're fine, right? Just, just, we have to get the announcement out Tuesday, though. We can't wait. It cannot be a game time decision. People are planning their viewing parties right now. We've got ads to still sell for the Super Bowl. We know that soda companies are not buying ads this year. I know. We're charging five and a half mil. You know why we're charging that, Roger, because we pay you. We're just trying to recoup some of our money back to pay Samson. We, we, we need to know before Saturday. We, we just have to, Roger. Okay, we'll hold. Roger picks up the phone, calls the Chiefs. Hey, what's the update? Yeah, let me speak to your doctor. So Goodell is on the phone with the doctor. Hey, how's it looking for Mahomes? Are we okay? I mean, it didn't look bad. We have it on replay. We're not showing it very much, but it, he looked, he, he was fine. Can I talk to him? He's, he can't talk? Well, uh, uh, can he just get on the phone? For, he's playing video games? I don't want him playing video games, guys. That means he's got to focus his eyes. I want his eyes closed in a dark room the entire day today. But I, I need him at practice for media day tomorrow. Okay. Hold, please. Hold, please. I've got the bills on the other line. Yes. No. Mahomes is in the concussion protocol. We are following every rule possible. I promise you. I Listen, if he can go, he can go. But it's all about safety. I know. No, I know that it'd be great for Buffalo to have its first ever Super Bowl win. They haven't been in there since the 90s. No, I agree with you. No, CBS very much wants you to be in the Super Bowl. No, that was not me coughing. No, I meant that. No, no, they do. No, we're going to follow the protocol exactly right. If he can't play, it may be a game time decision. You guys are going to have to prepare for both Mahomes and Henny. Yes, I would do that if I were you. Okay, thank you for calling. Hi, I'm back. Yeah, of course Mahomes is playing. No, I didn't tell Buffalo that. I told Buffalo that he may not be playing. Hold on. I've got, I've got Mahomes' agent on the line. Hold on one second. Yes. Oh, you. yes, he has to be available for commercials this week. No, he has to. He has to do two sit-downs and two commercials. You want him. I know, I know he signed that big deal, but part of that big deal, don't forget how much money he makes if he's the MVP of a Super Bowl. You got to get to the Super Bowl. You got to have him playing. But also part of what he makes on top of that is through the commercials. I know. Just keep him in the dark room one day. What's it? What, it's a dark room. What's the big deal? Okay. Thank you. All right. I, I got you. I got you. All right. Let me get back to CBS, please. Sean, we're done. We're good. It's fine. Don't you? Mayday. Mayday. May. We're fine. I think that's what happened. I mean, I can't be sure. It just feels like that's what happened. Well, Shane, nothing personal pick of the days. We're five and 10 because we suck. We split the football. I, I really thought that the Bills uh, under would win, but it lost. Um, no, let me, let me rewind that, Coca. Ready? Six, nine, four. Nothing personal pick of the day. We're five and 10. We picked all four games, but we picked the over under in the Packers Rams game. There were supposed to be defense in that game, and that defense went away. The Rams defense was terrible. That game went over. We lost. But we picked against Coca and we won because we had the Bills beating the Ravens. That's one and one on Saturday. Yesterday was an interesting day. We had the Chiefs 10 over the Browns. Mahomes is out like a light. They don't cover. We took the loss. And I was nervous about the second game, but I was pretty confident we had Tom Brady beating Drew Brees. Drew Brees was favored to win that game. Drew Brees is retiring after this season. Tom Brady is 43 years old, except I said I'm not betting against the Buccaneers. I'm just not going to do it. There is something about the NFC wanting Brady versus Rodgers. Now, what does the NFL want? I think they're okay with Rodgers winning next week, but they are rooting for Tom Brady because to have a home team in a home city for the first time ever and have it be Tom Brady... 
I think you may see some OPI, some DI, offense pass interference, defensive interferences. You may see a few shenanigans to get Sir Thomas Aquinas to his record 10th Super Bowl. I don't want to talk about it because I love the Packers. Do you know that Tom Brady, it's hard to imagine that this is true. Tom Brady has more playoff wins himself than all but five teams in the National Football League. It's, it's, that is a stat that is mind-bending to me. Next Sunday, Tom Brady will play in his 14th championship game, 13 AFC championships and one NFC championship. He's only had 19 seasons as a starter. It makes LeBron James and Michael Jordan and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar the only one who comes close is Bill Russell and Casey Jones in that group with the Celtics, and they're not even close. The level of greatness that Tom Brady has is surpassed by no one. He was on a field yesterday with Drew Brees, a first ballot Hall of Fame player. I didn't say person. Player. Go into Canton because there's no character issues in Canton. And... It was not close. Drew Brees looked old. Tom Brady looked perfect. (sighs) Okay. I got a story. Today's Monday. It's Martin Luther King Day. It's a day to sort of think about whether you're working, whether you're not working. If you're not working, why, why aren't you working? It's a holiday. Why is it a holiday? People trying to make this world better. You can make it better while you work. You can make it better while you don't work. I have a Martin Luther King Day story that is one of my top five game experiences ever. And I wanted to share it with you because it was 31 years ago today. The actual day was January 15th, but it was Martin Luther King Day, which is the Monday of Martin Luther King Day weekend, Martin Luther King Day. One of the things that the Knicks used to do back then, I was in uh, um, school I was in town. What year was the Martin Luther King Day game? I want to say it was January 15th, 1990, but now I'm thinking it could have been January 15th of 1991. I'm forgetting the exact year. It was either 90 or 91, Martin Luther King Day. The New York Knicks played afternoon games on Martin Luther King Day at the Garden, and I was lucky enough to get tickets, and I was lucky enough to be allowed to go with my friends. But the one condition put upon me is I had to bring my 11-year-old sister. What's the big deal? I got a list of instructions, and the instructions were very simple. Here's what she can eat. Here's what she can't eat. Here's how much of what she can eat she should eat. And here's what under no circumstances she can eat. And the number one rule when you take your sister, who's 11, to Madison Square Garden, don't lose her. Those were the rules. So I get a bunch of my friends together, and we are 22 years old. We're a bunch of nudniks, literally. You know, we're partying, and we're having fun, and we've got this sister, uh, my sister, who's great, very well-behaved and fine. So the way it happened in our home growing up is candy was verboten. There were no desserts. Desserts were raisins or prunes or dry cereal. No dessert, no cookies, no candy, no nothing. So any time we could escape from home, it became a candy frenzy. Back in the day, those who went to the garden would remember a store called Peppermint Park. Peppermint Park is now a Chase Bank in the front of Madison Square Garden, but it used to be a big candy store. And so when we would go to games, once in a while, we'd be allowed to go to Peppermint Park, get a little white bag, fill it with black jelly beans, and you got yourself some candy. That and October 31st were the only times you could have candy. Fine. I'm in charge now. I am in charge now. I'm your captain now. We go to the game. Samantha's in tow, dragging her along, got a bunch of friends, and we needed candy. I think you can imagine why. So we're hungry. I say to Samantha, because she's a candy addict, we're going to Peppermint Park. We We had a meal at Carnegie Deli, which is exactly perfect. Big pastrami and roast beef, et cetera. Some pickles, a schmear, some soup. Go to the game, get candy, sit down. I look at my list. She can have no cotton candy, no candy. Make sure she has chicken tenders and eats the tenders, and she can maybe have fries. I'm looking at that. I'm watching the Knicks play the Bulls. It's the first year of Phil Jackson's reign. 
I'm a huge Knicks fan at this time. We're still four years away from the NBA Finals, but we're in the middle of a great playoff run uh, and just loving the Knicks. I am paying zero attention to Samantha, zero, except making sure that she's not gone. And the way to do it is I sit on the aisle. I sit at an angle. So there's no way she can leave. It's like in Stratego, she was the flag and we were the bombs. So that's it. I'm not worried at all. She wants cotton candy done. You want more candy? Good. Chicken tenders? I don't care. Ice cream? No problem. End of the first quarter, more candy. I don't, are you going to vomit? If don't vomit, you can do anything, but if you have to go to the bathroom, I'm not taking you if it's during the game. I'm here to watch the game. So the game is proceeding on. It is tied at 106. I remember it like it was yesterday. Tied at 106. Game is ending. There is one tenth of a second left. I am getting everyone together. Samantha, get your coat on. I can't get my coat on. Let me help you get your coat on. It's winter. You got to wear your coat. I don't want you to get it sick. I don't want to get in trouble. Put the candy in your pocket. You can eat it in the cab. And then you got to throw it away. You can't bring it home. Take this sticky from cotton candy. Wipe your face. We're all getting ready. Meanwhile, we're not leaving the game because there's a tenth of a second left and there could be overtime. But in New York, when you were at a Knicks game and it's sold out, you've got to be mobile quickly when the game ends. And I mean quick because you got to get down the escalators, get to 7th Avenue and get yourself a taxi. Fine. Inbound. Mark Jackson's got the ball. One tenth of a second left. He throws it to Trent Tucker. Trent Tucker in the corner, turns around, pulls up for a three, shoots it. We're looking. The clock, the buzzer didn't go off. The shot is good. It can't be. Did the Knicks just win 109-106 with one tenth of a second left when I was ready not to leave because I assumed it would be overtime? The shot goes through the net. Instead of jumping up and down, like my parental instincts took over, which is ironic given the fact that that's generally oxymoronic as I would come to find out. Get your coat. We got to go. We run out of the garden. She's running behind me. I'm dragging her by the hand to the point where DSS may start asking questions. Candy's dropping everywhere. Jelly beans. It's like dropping bird seed in case we want to get back to the seats. We make it out. We cannot believe that we just witnessed the Knicks win a game. 109-106 109-106 on a three-point shot by Trent Tucker with one-tenth of a second left. We get her home, return her to sender, and we are, were all a part of history on Martin Luther King Day because that, folks, was the game. That was the Trent Tucker rule. That became a rule the next year or a few years later. The Trent Tucker rule means that when there are three-tenths of a second left or fewer, there have to be three-tenths of a second left or greater in order to catch and shoot. The days of the one-tenth of a second or two-tenths of a second catch and shoot are gone. All that you can do with that much time left on the clock is do like an alley-oop, which, by the way, that was the play call, an alley-oop, because Jackson was the alley-oop giver in those days to Patrick Ewing from out of bounds. That was the play, but that play didn't happen because the Bulls took it away, so he had to go to his outlet guy, which was Tucker in the corner. Happy 31st anniversary. That was quite a game. And now you've got the Trent Tucker rule. Trent Tucker, who's famous for that, even though we ended up winning a ring with the Bulls, by the way. So my pick of the day today is the Knicks because the Knicks win on Martin Luther King Day. And they're getting a point and a half over the Magic. I'd like to get a little extra juice here and take them in the money line. But Knicks plus one and a half over Magic, that is the nothing personal pick of the day. All right, Coca. Something happened here, and someone asked about it. You know what I want? (laughs) I want to talk to Samson. I want to talk to Samson. So here's what happens. Get in your, get in my Twitter, David P. Samson. Get in the DMs and ask me a question. We'll try to get to it on the show. We also do an end-of-month mailbag bonus episode. I know you love those, and I love doing those. So that for that, you rate and review on Apple. Five stars, write a review. Are you taking notes? I know this is too much of a dump at once, except that's what I do. I'm a dumper at once kind of guy. Subscribe, rate, review, ask a question on Apple. Thank you. Or you can get into Twitter, David P. Sampson, ask a question. Wherever you are listening to this, hit the subscribe button and tell two friends today. I'm getting greedy here as we're getting into February. Two friends today. It's because of you were like a top, I was told this like a top 50 now consistently. Thank you. I'm very appreciative of your loyalty. Please download, rate, subscribe. So you want to talk to Samson. 
Why did the Pacers let the Harden trade happen if Karis Levert had a mass in his kidney? This is a serious topic, actually, but it comes down to something that you may think you know about because you do because we're in episode 293 of Nothing Personal. That's the big Harden trade where Harden went from the Rockets when he had checkmate on Tillman Fernita. He goes to the Nets, four teams involved. They had the Cavs. They had the Pacers. They all got together. The way multi-team trades work, it starts with two, a regular trade. I want that guy. Well, that's okay. You can have that guy. But if you want me to give you this guy, you've got to go get me that guy over there. I'll be right back to you. You call that team. Hey, we're going to need that guy. Yeah, I'll trade you, but I got to get that guy. Uh, Yeah, I'm going to trade him to them, but I need that guy. Hold on. If I'm going to trade you this guy, I'm going to want that guy just over there. Oh, for Christ's sake. Fine. Hold on. You call the next team. Hey, we're going to need that guy to give it to those guys so he can give us this guy because we need that guy in order to get those guys right here. You got that guy? Four teams. A lot of moving parts. You got physicals going back and forth. The way trades work is you come up with a trade agreement. It's a contract. It's a one-page contract that you write. It's called the letter of agreement, an LOA. It's executed normally by the GMs of the teams. It states what the specifics of the trade will be. It always says pending league approval and physicals. Now, some say pending a physical. Some say pending medical approval. Medical approval is code for when you're not going to have time or an interest in doing a physical before the trade. And you're just going to do it pending an exchange of information because you look at the player's medical records that existed when he played for the other team. They One doctor sends it to another. The doctor looks at it and says, all right, it looks fine. Calls the team president. Hey, it looks fine. GM, good. Call the other team. Pass. Everything's good. So that's how a trade will happen. Two-team trade, fine. Three-team, more complicated. Four-team, an absolute cluster duck of complication. You've got salary cap implications, et cetera, in the NBA. All right, so physicals happen after the trade has been leaked and announced. This is an issue for me. Back in the day, we didn't have to rush through physicals. We didn't have to rush through exchange of medical information because news of trades would not leak out unless we would leak it. Things were much closer to the best. Now, for whatever reason, social media, blogging, Twitter, Instagram, whatever the case may be, the reality is news of a trade is out way before it needs to be. You heard the story on a, on a either it was on this show or a Different show, but you may have heard the Josh Johnson story of the Toronto Blue Jays trade in 2012 with Henderson Alvarez when both Josh Johnson and Henderson Alvarez failed their physicals. We were not going to take Henderson Alvarez. They were not going to take Josh Johnson, but word had gotten out that the Toronto Blue Jays were getting Jose Reyes and Mark Burley and John Buck and blah, 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 blah. We had already taken the huge hit for trading all the money. We had to trade all the money. We just said to Toronto, you know what? We'll take Alvarez. Hopefully his arm won't fall off. You take Johnson. Hopefully his arm won't fall off. The odds are both their arms will fall off. But the fact is we need to make this trade. The trade happens. You worry about it later. You tend to swallow hard when you have a lot to chew on. So what happened in this trade is that the Nets were so far gone, they had to make this trade. Whatever it was going to take, So LeVert gets a physical, and it is discovered, uh, unbelievably, that he has a mass in his kidney. Unclear, God willing, fingers and toes crossed that it is nothing, but a growth that can be taken care of that is completely benign. But anytime you hear growth and kidney, you get scared of the C word. Why was that trade not taken down? Well, the Pacers, who took Levert and traded Oladapo as part of the Harden deal, they had to get rid of Oladapo because he was a pending free agent. They weren't going to re-sign him, and they wanted to get assets back. Levert happens to be an outstanding player. 
I said Oladapo. It's Oladipo. Excuse me, Coca. Thank you. Uh, Oladipo. So the Pacers said, we got to take our chances here. And then the team president walked in and said, you may want to take your chances, but we're going to take advantage of the Nets and the fact that they want James Harden so badly and that they need the Pacers to be part of this trade. Here's what we're going to do. And it's going to be simple. Don't get upset. Get on the phone. Call the Nets. Call the league. Tell the league you're about to pull down this huge trade that has given the NBA all this juice and bringing a super team to the Nets. You're going to ruin the whole damn thing. I'll get back to you in a minute, Adam, but I'm about to turn down the entire trade. Give me one second. Hey, Nets, Sean, we got a situation here. Yeah, we're going to need money. Yes, we are. Yes, right now. We're going to want about $2.5 million. What? Because Levert has a mass in his kidney, you're going to keep the trade and ask us for $2.6 million? If I'm Sean Marks, I say, screw you. Undo the whole trade. I'm not giving you $2.6 million. We'll take LeVert back. That's what I would do. No, the GM and the owner wouldn't do that. The GM would go to the owner and say, man, it's it's $2.6 million. You're going to make that money back in two seconds. Because by the time the Nets are in the conference finals and the NBA finals, we're going to have full capacity. Everyone's going to be vaccinated. You are going to be rich. You are going to be the team of New York. It's $2.6 million. Just close your eyes and write the check to the Pacers. Just close your eyes. Just do it. Close your eyes. I'm going to guide your hand when you write the check. I'm going to guide it. You want to do a wire? We could do a wire. Better. No, write the check. Just watch me. I'm I'm touching your hand. I'm writing the check. Two million and S-I-X-H-U-N-D-R-E-D-T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D-A-N-D. And then you put an XX over the XX. Yes, do that. Send it. We're good. That's really what happened. Why did the Pacers let Harden trade happen? Because they didn't want... What, what happened to Akoka? Say it again. Oladipo. They believed that Levert was going to be fine eventually, and they got an extra $2.6 million because the Nets were 12 months pregnant and they're not elephants. Thanks for the question. Okay, when we come back, we're going to review a movie that stars a former all-pro football player whose name is not Alex Karras or Fred Dreyer. And we're also going to talk about what the Yankees did while we were all paying attention to the NFL. We will be right back here on Nothing Personal with David Sapps. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. My name's David. Today is Monday, January 18th, 2021. For those of you not working today, make sure you take a minute to know why you're not working. Make sure you take a minute to appreciate what some people have to do to try to make this world a better place. While we sit around in our skivvies, drinking and watching football. Just to thank you. Coca gave me a movie to watch. You all give me movies to watch and I have a list. I've shown it to you on the, on camera, on the screen for, for, for balance. I'm going to hold it like this. And, um, There is a uh, list of movies. Whenever you send me your suggestions, I appreciate it. I was asked to watch Sylvie's Love. Sylvie's Love stars Tessa Thompson and Namdi Asmoa. I, Coke, I'm sorry. Is that possible? So I don't know anything about the movie. When Coca says watch it, I watch it. So I watched it uh, yesterday morning. Uh, The curtain went up at about 5.11 a.m., and it was done by about 7 a.m. on Sunday, the divisional playoff day, the day of the, uh, the Chiefs game. The movie takes place in the early years in New York, 1950s maybe, 1960s. Sylvie is a character who's played by Tessa Thompson. She is a works in a record store for her father, but wants to be a producer, becomes a production assistant, eventually becomes a producer. An, a very interesting line in the movie. She had no idea that a Negro could be a producer. That is a quote from the movie. No idea that an African-American could be a producer until she interviewed with an African-American female producer. Interesting to see how 
far we've come and how far we haven't come in many ways. She meets a saxophonist played by Namdi. And what starts is this unbelievably interesting and deep love story. It's got ups, it's got downs, it's got surprises, it's got absence, it's got reunions, it's got, it's got um, breakups, makeups, and it's got a connection between these two actors that was electric. And I don't mean electric like in Bridgerton where there's all these random sex scenes out of nowhere uh, or, or The Great, which, which I'm watching now, which has that as well with Nick Holt. This was just a beautiful movie. So I finished the movie. And it's a strong recommendation, by the way. I speak to Coca, and Coca says, you know, Namdi is a football player. And I said, what do you, no, he's not. He's this small guy. He's not a football player. Guess what? The star of this movie is not just Kerry Washington's husband, but also was an all-pro defensive back. Signed a five-year deal with the Philadelphia Eagles as a free agent in 2011. Was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Retired in 2016. Went into acting. And he is now a leading man. And that's not the most interesting part about Namdi. Not that he's married to Kerry Washington. That comes in third. Not that he was a professional football player who now is a first-rate actor. That comes in second. Having read about him, because I was fascinated, and I read about movies after I watch them, I read the trivia. I'll read the review after the movie, not before the movie. I'll read about the actors if I've never heard of them. I'll go back through their filmography to see where I may have seen them. He won man of the year in the NFL. His charitable pursuits and the amount of time that he spends giving back to the community is exemplary. To this day, he doesn't need to anymore. To this day, he does things for the community that are rare and amazing. So Namdi, I congratulate you. And the reason I congratulate him is that you make it so we can all dream. We'd love to be a professional athlete. We'd love to be a movie star. You found a way to be both. And by the way, you go home at night and you're married to Kerry Washington. Don't know her, but... Seems like an incredible woman. So please go watch Sylvie's Love. Okay, what happened this weekend uh, with the Yankees? I can't remember if, if, we, if this happened on Friday and we talked about it on the show where DJ LeMayhew was signed by the Yankees. Uh, I know that I was on CBS Sports HQ, Coca. I have no recollection if he signed prior to the Friday show or if he signed on Thursday or even last week. Frankly, this may not have even been a weekend thing, but to me, this felt like a weekend issue. So DJ LeMayhew got his deal with the Yankees. He got six years, $90 million. That's only $15 million a year. He was looking for $100 million over four years. He ended up getting under one hundred, but over um, 80, 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, 90. $90 million, which is the difference between 80 that the Yankees wanted to give him and 100 that LeMahieu wanted. Why six years when the Yankees only wanted to go three or four years? The Yankees were thrilled to go out six years because that lowers the AAV. If you pay him $90 million over the four years that he's going to be productive, which he really won't be, he'll be, it really should be a three-year deal for LeMahieu. But if you give him $90 million for three, that's $30 million a year. Even if you defer it, that counts towards your competitive balance tax, your luxury tax. And the Yankees are nudging up against the tax. But if you sign him to a six-year deal and give him the same $90 million, instead of $30 million a year on your payroll per tax, it's $15 million per year, which keeps you below the tax. You know LeMayhew's not going to be on your team six years from now. You know you're going to pay him $15 million. No problem. It's like deferring his, it's like paying him $30 million this year, but pay $15 now, defer $15 to four years from now. But if you did that literally, then you'd have a $30 million hit. So instead, you just take it out. LeMayhew said, I'm going to be a free agent. If this three-year deal or four-year deal expires, I'll be 35, whatever years old I'll be. I'm not going to get 15 million a year, not even close. There's no chance. I'm already outperforming what I thought I could be in the last years with the Yankees. 
when they were paying me 12 million a year for two years, I've now turned two years for 24 into 90 million for what I believe is three years, maybe four, I can be good for four, but I highly doubt it, but definitely three in my mind at most. So he goes to the Yankees and says, hey, just get me above 80, go below 100, that's fine. Let's split the difference, go out as many years as you want. You've got to make it reasonable. Six years, 90 million, DJ LeMahieu back with the Yankees. We predicted it, it happened, done, fine. Then all of a sudden, we talked about Corey Kluber. Corey Kluber is the Cy Young Award-winning pitcher who pitched for the Cleveland Indians, and he was lights OU triple T until he got H-U-R-T. He comes back from injury. He's pitching in Marlins Park. Comebacker breaks his arm out. Comes back, breaks his ribs, does something else. To make a long story short, Corey Kluber has not been a Cy Young Award-winning pitcher for dos anos. Yet, when you are signing him, you say two-time Cy Young Award-winning pitcher. That's true. Just like I'm the two-time magician in elementary school, That's the team that I made when you have to drill the ball with two hands and do basketball tricks. Yeah, I made the magicians. I'm a two-time magician. How about this one? Two-time 40 under 40 winner, David Sampson. Does that mean crap? No, I'm 52. Yeah, I still have it. Yeah, it's on the resume. I get it, but it is not an indication that I'm under 40 now. So when you call Corey a two-time Cy Young Award winner, it's not like he's the two-time defending Cy Young Award winner. He is far removed from his Cy Young days. So far removed, he had to do a showcase. So he did a showcase. I explained to you on Twitter, maybe on this show, what it is to do a showcase. A showcase means you go on a mound and you throw. And if you're not throwing 70 and your arm doesn't fall off, scouts are going to leave and say, ooh, he looks good. Let's bring him in. Corey Kluber has been working with the Yankee strength guy, the new Yankee strength guy who Brian Cashman loves, who's trying to make it so that Stanton and Judge and everybody else stops getting hurt. Yeah, that guy. So Corey Kluber has been working with him. Everything's going well. Kluber is rehabbing. He's ready to go for the 2021 season. He's back. We just got to do a showcase. The Yankees say to Corey Kluber's agent, don't do the showcase. We'll sign you. We'll give you 5 million bucks. Just come pitch for us. We need a number two starter behind Cole. And you're a two-time Cy Young Award winner. And we're not going to pay Tanaka 15 or 20 million. Severino's coming off Tommy John. And then we got Montgomery and Sleepy and Dopey. And we're the damn Yankees. I love that show. Okay. Kluber says, nah, I think I can do better than five. Not much better, but I think I can do better. I'm going to do what's called the showcase. Everyone's going to come. He does the showcase. 25 teams come. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere... He's like the reigning Cy Young Award winner. Teams are fighting over each other to sign Corey Kluber. Guess what? The Yankees paid up for Corey Kluber, a number that is so absurd that it made me laugh. Corey Kluber got a one-year $11 million deal. $11 million guaranteed for a guy who's made, has he pitched like eight innings in two years or eight starts in two years? It's something outrageous. $11 million to be the Yankees' number two starter. And the reason they're saying it is, well, we've watched him rehab. He's been with our guy. We didn't need the showcase. We were ready. Conveniently, signing LeMahieu at 15 and Corey Kluber at 11 is 26. They're still under the cap. There won't be Springer under the Christmas tree or Bauer or any sizable free agent right now because they're too close to that luxury tax threshold and they're not going to go over no matter how badly they want to catch the Mets. It's just not going to happen. Corey Kluber did it right. He rehabbed with the guy from the team who was going to spend, did a showcase to make the team that was going to spend believe that he was going to go elsewhere because there's such a premium pitching, and he turned that into $11 million. Cash, you're losing your touch. There's no way anyone was coming close to that. So then, here is the denouement. Word leaks out. Kluber had bigger offers with other teams. Do you know when that gets out? That gets out when I know I've overpaid for someone and I want to make myself feel better. So I leak out the fact that I know for a fact this guy had better offers, but he wanted to be in Miami because of the taxes and the sun and the fun in South Beach and our strength guy. G-M-A-B. I'll give you a wait to see. That's when I tell you something's going to happen. May happen. May not happen. Corey Kluber will have fewer than 20 starts in 2021. Book it. 
fewer than 20 starts in 2021. You just wait to see. Well, that's it for another edition of Nothing Personal. Thanks for being here. And just remember, it's just business. It's nothing personal.